we went over the paper a bit of linear algebra, and I introduced the definition of orthogonal matrix and orthonormal column, orthonormal vectors. Um, I did it in the context of computing the eigenvalues of a matrix. In particular, if a matrix is symmetric, and by symmetric I mean that the matrix is equal to its transpose, um, then that matrix admits a singular value decomposition, um, x lambda x transpose, and the, where x is the matrix that contains all the eigenvectors of A, if A is m by m, A will have m eigenvectors, and each of these eigenvectors is of size m. Um, so if you put all the eigenvectors together, you get an m by m matrix. And one theorem that I haven't proven for you, but which is true, is that those eigenvectors are orthogonal, and they form um, the matrix formed by those eigenvectors. It happens to be an orthogonal matrix. Um, the significance of that will will come soon. Um, and an orthogonal matrix it just means that the transpose is equal to the inverse, so we don't have to do n cube compute steps in order to compute it. Um, so it's very easy to compute uh, orthogonal matrices. And um, the other definition that I introduced was orthonormal. So the columns of the matrix big X um, are eigenvectors. And if you take the dot product of two of those eigenvectors, um, the dot product will be zero unless it's the dot, unless it's the eigenvector dotted with itself. All right, so we're having projected trouble, so the next bit I'm going to move on to the board. Um, so a matrix can be decomposed into the product of another matrix, a diagonal matrix of eigenvalues, and another matrix of um, eigenvectors. And we can rewrite this as in terms of the eigenvectors. I'm assuming the matrix is M by M, so the matrix has M eigenvectors. This big matrix um, lambda, and recall that the two bars means that it's a matrix, um, one bar means that it's a vector. Um, so, to make it a bit more clear, I'm going to write the sizes. A is M by M, so square matrix. This will also be M by M. M by M. And this guy is, of course, M by M. And no one told me about it, but I forgot the transpose. Okay? So, we can write it in matrix notation. Um, and this is a quick way of writing essentially all these equations. Lambda 1, x1. So I can write 
the M eigenvalue equations for the matrix A, which would be um, each of these guys. Or alternatively, I can write it in a compact notation just by writing it as a matrix like this, um, where I'm going to have to put the eigenvalues in a diagonal matrix. And when I transpose a matrix in terms of its vectors, what I do is I transpose each of the vectors. Okay, that's essentially the definition of a tr the transpose of a matrix. Okay. So by using this matrix notation, I'm essentially in very little writing just by using three symbols, I'm able to say all of this. Okay, so that's the intent of introducing this notation. Um, I can also say that this is equal, if I multiply these guys, <coughs> lambda 1, x1, x1 transpose, plus lambda 2, x2, x2 transpose, plus 1, 2, dot, 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 lambda m, x m, okay. So this expansion gives me another way of writing A. A is the outer product of an expansion of these um, eigenvectors. Each scalar, each lambda is 1 by 1. This is 1 by m and the transpose is m by 1. Okay, so this guy here is m by 1. This guy here is 1 by m. Okay, because we still have an m by m matrix. Is m by 1? Oh, thank you. Yes. Right? So, so what I'm doing is I'm taking, in order to do matrix multiplication, a matrix can be written as in terms of outer products like this. Okay? Something that's m by m. In order to get something that's m by m, you need something that's m by 1 times something that's 1 by m. Okay. I see a lot of blank faces. Should we do an example with numbers? Um, if you t suppose that x is equal to uh, 1, 2, x transpose is equal to 1, 2, and then x times x transpose is equal to 1, 2 <coughs> times 1, 2. And then when we multiply a column vector times a row vector, we would do 1 times 1 gives us 1, 1 times 2 is 2, 2 times 1, 2, 2 times 2, 4. Okay, so a matrix can be written in terms of products of vectors that are vertical times vectors that are horizontal. And that's essentially what I've done here. A matrix can be written as an expansion, and I often call this an expansion because it's a combination of terms uh, where you're adding them. And each term you could think of um, a number, lambda 1, times one of these outer products. Okay. So a matrix can be written as a number times um, outer products of these vectors. And so these are different ways of writing the same thing and it's just useful to know 
how to write it in these different notations. Because it helps us with code and it helps us with uh, um, you know, do, doing derivation script. Okay, I think we are in luck. Our projectors will be back in 45 minutes. <laughs> Okay, so there was one more thing I hadn't um, explained in the last class, and I'm just going to do it here. And that's the norm of a vector. If we have a vector x, okay. And I'm going to say that x, I'm going to use this notation. x is in R m by 1. When I write this, what I mean is that x has m real numbers. Okay, so it's a column vector with m real numbers. Uh, for example, x equal. 3.215 minus 6.1, say. So in this case, I say that x is in R4 because there are four numbers. Okay. The norm of x is essentially the length of x and is defined as our usual Euclidean distance. So the norm of x will be x1, the first component squared, plus the second component squared, plus the third component squared, and so on, until you get to the last component. Okay, so the norm of a vector is just essentially the length of a vector. Um, it can also be written, because this is essentially the dot product of a vector, it can also be written as x transpose x. Okay. And now because it's a column vector, I'm taking something like this times something like this that gives me the norm of a vector. Okay. And a quick example, if you have a vector x, which is equal to 1, 2, um, x transpose x is equal to 1, 2 times 1, 2, and that's equal to 5. The norm of x in this case is just square root of 5. Okay, it's the length of that vector. Um, often, in the notation, one puts a 2 here because this type of norm has actually got a specific name. This is called the Euclidean norm or the 2 norm, the L2 norm or the 2 norm. Um, unless I need a different kind of norm, I'm going to assume that all the norms that I'm using for now are L2 norms, so I'm not going to bother with putting a 2 there. I'm going to keep the notation simple. Okay, so, oh, and we have our projector back. Here is a nice um, um, result that follows from norms. Um, if you, if we have a matrix Q, and let Q be orthogonal, in other words, let it be that Q transpose is equal to Q minus one. Then let's assume that we multiply uh, a, an arbitrary vector x times the matrix Q. Okay, so we, we use the definition. We transpose Qx times Qx. Pardon, there was a Oh, thank you. Let's take it back now. That's better, thanks. Um, so we first transpose that vector. Now there's a rule of transposes which is A times B transpose 
is equal to B transpose A transpose. Okay, and that allows me to rewrite that first term as this guy. So that's Q times X transpose. But now since Q is, Q transpose is equal to Q inverse, Q transpose times Q cancels, right? Because the inverse of a matrix times itself is just the identity. And so I just get X transpose X, which is just the norm of X. So if I take any matrix that happens to be an orthogonal matrix and I multiply it times a vector, it doesn't change the norm. The norm of QX is the same as the norm of X. For that reason, Q is also called a, ro a rotation matrix. If you will, when you multiply a vector by Q, you just rotate that vector. You never change its length. And the folks that do computer graphics, you know, when you go and watch uh, Finding Nemo, whatever, um, they use this trick all the time. If they want to rotate pixels on the screen, they basically multiply by rotation matrices. And there's rotation matrices, there's translation matrices, scaling matrices, and so on. And graphics is just about manipulating these different matrices to get to see Nemo. Okay, that's all the revision. of linear algebra that we need for this course. Um, let's try to move back to do now more interesting stuff. Okay. All right. So in, in, in this class and the next class, uh, we're going to cover uh, something called um, the SPD, and we're going to introduce PCA, which are very, is a very widely used technique for data analysis. Um, in this lecture, I will define what the SPD is. Um, I'll explain how to compute the SPD, and I'll illustrate with an example how you can do that. Um, I'll talk about low rank approximation, what it means, and what implications it has for uh, data compression. Okay, definition of the SVD. The SVD is just a matrix factorization. It's very similar to this matrix factorization. And in fact, if you know this matrix factorization, if you can compute this one, if you can compute eigenvectors, <coughs> you can compute the SVD, as we will soon see. Um, here is the magic thing about the SVD. It applies to matrices that are not square, m by n. And that is super useful. Because if you look at images, images are essentially, if you look at the grayscale image, it's just a matrix, right? Because you have m by n pixels, and the, the intensity of the light of each pixel is just a number between 0 and um, 255. So that's essentially we have a matrix. Um, but it's hardly the images that we see on the internet are square matrices. Most of the time, they're in fact or, uh, you know, rectangles. And so we need tools that allow us to do eigenvalues with the non-square matrices. And the SVD is essentially that. It's a tool to do eigenvalues when the matrix is non-square. OK, so it has the following. Um, it will contain, so suppose we care about this matrix A. OK. And let's say that A is M by N. Um, then in the, the SVD consists of the product of three matrices. Um, the first matrix, sigma, it's kind of like lambda here. It will have something that's related to the eigenvalues in the diagram. Those guys will be called the singular values. It's going to have two kinds of eigenvectors. It's going to have the left eigenvectors and the right eigenvectors. And the right, the reason why it has two is because the sizes are different. Some of the vectors will be of size m, and the other, the ones on the right have to be of size n, so that the dimensions match. Okay? So the matrix U, oops, the matrix U will be m by n 
whereas this matrix here will be n by n. Okay, so you can think of n left singular eigenvalues, left eigenval eigenvectors, um, and I often get that word mixed up. So when you go to these matrices, instead of calling them eigen, we call them singular. <coughs> so an eigenvector becomes a singular vector, an eigenvalue becomes a singular value. So the name just changes by changing the word eigen with singular. The left singular <coughs> vectors have size m, and the right singular vectors have size n. Okay. Um, now the SVD can be, it's unique. Um, I'm, I'm not, one can prove such a theorem. I'm not proving it here. It's usually left for a, an advanced linear algebra class. Um, its eigenvalues are in the diagonal and they will be ordered. Um, the order essentially is like when we compute eigenvalues. We can pick an arbitrary order. Um, U will have orthonormal columns. The implication is that U transpose U will be the identity. But it is not true that U, U transpose is the identity. All we're saying is it has orthonormal columns. We're not saying it's orthogonal. V, on the other hand, will be orthogonal. Okay, one of the properties of the SVD is it produces an orthogonal V. And so it will be V is equal to V transpose. Now, depending on the version of code you use to implement the SVD, um, you will find that sometimes the matrix U is not M by N, but sometimes it will be M by M. So, in some code, U is M by M. And what happens there is that Essentially, we have A, we have the matrix U, and some software just adds a few extra columns to U, and then it puts the matrix um, sigma here, and it puts a bunch of zeros under so that the dimensions match. And then you have still V transpose here. Okay, so, so some code will add these artificial, these extra columns to the matrix U, and it does it via a process called Gram-Schmidt, some orthogonalization process, in order to make U M by M, so that it, U is orthogonal. Um, it doesn't matter whether your code does it that way, or whether the code does it the way I'm explaining it. For our intents and purposes, it just will not matter. All the exercises, all the math, it's, it's all going to be the same. So it won't matter whether there's those extra columns there or not. So when Python spits out something that might not look like what I explained, don't worry about those extra columns because we will never touch them. So are we, do we care if M is bigger than N or N is bigger than M here? Um, no, we don't. In general, so because the padding might change depending on... Th that is true. So that, that's a very good point. Depending on whether M is larger than M, the padding may, may change. So Python may or may not do this pad padding. I think NumPy latest version does do this padding. So if you see the extra padding, just ignore that padding. We don't, as you will soon see, that padding is irrelevant for what we care about. Okay, so I'm gonna stick with um, the version where you there, and there aren't those zeros, and that's often also called the thin SVD. Okay, so in particular, I'm going to have A is equal to U sigma V transpose. Um, in other words, A11, A12, all the way up to A1N. Oops, I messed that one up. So A is M by N, so it's going to be equal to 
to a matrix that will have the singular vectors as columns. times the singular values in a diagonal and there will be n of them times <coughs> the singular vectors. So just like we did um, over here, we can write it um, in terms of matrices or we can write it in terms of the vectors that are components of the matrix. So let me put the dimensions just to be clear. This is m by n. Um, this is m by n. And so the particular version of the SVD that I will use is called the thin SVD, where u is m by n, this is n by n, and this is n by n. And so this guy has to be n by 1. And this guy here is 1 by n. Okay. And just like we did with eigenvalues, I can write a is equal to u1, so sigma1 times u1 times v1 transpose plus sigma2 u2 v2 transpose plus sigma3 u3 v3 transpose all the way up to the nth term, which is sigma n u n v n. One too many transposes. <coughs> okay. So up to now I'm just giving you different notations. I haven't told you how to compute this. I haven't told you how, what we're going to do with this. And we haven't done anything fun yet. I'm just giving you the dry definition of it. M is greater than N, we are in essence just throwing away the excess um, dimensions of the left eigenvectors. Mm -hmm. We're just ignoring those dimensions for each. Yeah, that's correct. Um, okay, so here is, um, so that's our, our expansion and there's the thing to be aware of here is that there's these three different ways of writing it. You write in terms of its comp um, in terms of an expansion of its individual components, or you um, we write it. Oops, I forgot one of these guys. There we go. Or we write it in terms of just the matrix notation, which is faster. Okay, so. How will this be useful? Suppose we have now a matrix A and this matrix will be an image. And why is an image a matrix? Because an image is just an array with numbers. 3, 5, 255, 1, 5, I don't know, 20, 40, 60, 3. Something like this. Okay, so that's, that would be an image with 3 by 3 pixels and each number in, is essentially the intensity of light of the pixel. 255 means white, 0 means black and uh, all the numbers in between give you different scales. What we're saying, it, when we do the decomposition, what we're saying is the matrix can be written as an image that is generated by taking the outer product, so sigma1, u1, v1 transpose, plus another image that's formed by the second component, uh, 
and so on. And here it just starts getting to be fun, okay? Because now we're saying an image decomposes into many images, okay? And we know how to compute that decomposition. Okay? Because once I tell you how to compute the SVD, you will be able to take an image and break that image into um, a decomposition whereby the first um, image will have the sort of broad brush strokes of light. Um, sadly, projection here is not so awesome, so um, let me try one more light. Let's make this really dark. Okay, let's see if that's a bit better, a little bit better. So um, the first component, sigma 1 times u1, v1 transpose, it's giving you an image that essentially is capturing the sort of the broad regions of light of the image. The next component is give you something that has a bit more detail. And as you move to the right, the subsequent components will focus on tinier details. So essentially if you're decomposing an image into smooth brush strokes and as you move on, like finer and finer brush strokes. And the beautiful thing about this is this sort of is going to be the basis for the compressor. So recall that when we started in the introductory lectures, I told you that one of the things that um, our brain does, so we showed with that experiment with the cats, is that we have all these neurons back here um, that are these 20 million or so neurons, that each neuron fires for a different thing about, uh, you know, like at different ages and so on in the world. Now what we're saying here is like imagine that if each neuron tunes to a different amount of light, but now these neurons are sort of global because they look at the light in the whole image, um, then you would have a decomposition of the image in terms of the, um, in terms of a, a distributed representation. That is where you have several images where each neuron fires for different amounts of light. I'll make that a bit more clear in the next class. Um, but that's, so this will take us to a lot of really fun stuff. Because <coughs> from here, it will be very easy to get to be able to explain, to come up with a model that actually gives us the same as what we observe when we take measurements from a cat. And that will come in the next class. Before that, we need to do something a bit drier, which is, but which is nonetheless instructive, which is, how to compute the SVD? I just have a question with these images. Mm -hmm. um, were they um, scaled correctly? Because it seems like yes. I'm sure you had a lot and yes. had more and more. You'll get to do this for your homework, next homework. I'm, I'm going to show you in, in a bit the code that I used to generate those two. OK, but before that, let's see how we compute the SVD. Because once we know how to compute SVD for a small matrix and a small example, we'll feel a bit more comfortable with it. So I'm going to use the following property, that the singular values of A are the positive square roots of the non-zero eigenvalues of either A transpose A or A A transpose. If I know how to compute the eigenvalues, here's the claim. If I know how to compute the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of A A transpose or A transpose A, I can recover u sigma and v, or I can estimate u sigma and v. I often use the word, someone asked this, and I often use the word recover for estimating, sort of. All right, so how do we go about proving this? Okay, so the first thing is to note that these are symmetric matrices. Okay, and the reason is because if you take A transpose A, and we transpose, we get A transpose, A uh, transpose, transpose, which is equal to A transpose A. OK? 
Okay, because if you transpose and transpose a matrix again, you're back to the same matrix, right? Have some have something like this, go like this, and then go like this, you're back to where you were before. Okay, so these are symmetric matrices by definition. The same is true for the other one. And they have the following property. If we start, if we write A transpose A, and we substitute A using the definition of the SVD, so we'll use the definition, and we're going to write as U sigma V transpose, and then we're going to transpose, and we multiply times A. Okay, so I'm just substituting, instead of A, I'm writing the SVD of A which again is U sigma V transpose. And I'm not putting the double bars for now because they kind of, these are all matrices now. And I can rewrite this using the properties of transpose as V transpose transpose sigma transpose U transpose U sigma V transpose. Okay, so when you transpose, you just change the order of the matrices and you transpose them all. And that is equal to V. Now, sigma is a diagonal matrix. It's like this matrix over there. So if you transpose a diagonal matrix, you don't change the matrix, right? Because it's square and it's diagonal, so you swap the off-diagonal entries, they're all zeros, so we still end up with the same matrix. And then we have U transpose U sigma V transpose. Okay, but U, we said, has by definition orthonormal columns, and so U transpose U is just the identity. So we get V and then sigma times sigma is V sigma squared. U um, just has orthogonal columns, but it's not orthogonal? That's correct. Okay. Okay, the properties. Okay. Likewise, if I do A, A transpose. Oh, I have a question. Just a second. Go ahead. Um, so, uh, if you have, like, just in the square matrix eigen case, um, and you find the eigen vectors, and is it true that you can, like, does the orthonormal thing mean that you can um, put them in any order and make that matrix where the columns are the eigen vectors, and that if you find well, the, the transpose will be the inverse. Stop. Yeah, the order is arbitrary, right? Because when you compute eigenvalues, you're, you're solving roots, so you could solve for the larger root first or the smaller root first. The other important thing is that you know that the each eigenvalue has to be associated with the right mm -hmm. eigenvector. So you could also do everything we're doing and just swap the orders, but. But we're going to follow the convention and we're just going to pick the order where they're diminishing in size. Just, just for convention. No, no other reason. So I, sh I should probably emphasize that, that uh, just by convention, I'm going to choose this. And by definition, they're also positive. But that's just an arbitrary order. But we pick it because we need to pick some order. OK. So here we do the same thing. We do U times sigma times V transpose times V, um, sorry, V sigma U transpose. OK, I'm, I've skipped a few steps quickly. And I will let you go over these steps carefully at home. Okay. Now I was 
fast. And I use the properties. So you transpose, you switch the order, you transpose everything, and then V transpose V is the identity, and so we get U sigma uh, squared U transpose. Okay, now, now that I have that, the claim is that that's all I need. Okay, because if I'm given a matrix A that is non square, that is M by N, and in this, in, in this case A could be um, M by N. If I'm given a matrix that's M by N, what I do is I form A transpose A or A A transpose, and then I just compute the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors, right? Because these expressions, these look like what we had before. These look like the expressions that are there on the board, which are of this form. Okay, both of them. And that means that if we ju I just create, if I take the matrix, I multiply it times itself, transpose, and I compute eigenvalues and eigenvectors, provided that I can compute eigenvalues, eigenvectors, then it's just a question of matching. Lambda is equal to sigma squared, and x is equal to v. And that allows me to compute sigma, and allows me to compute v. And then I do the same thing for AA transpose, and that allows me to compute u. And that's how actually computers compute the SVD. That's one way they do it. Let's do it with an example. Let's assume that I'm giving you, that I give you A equal 1, 2, 3. Okay, so that's my matrix. Um, in this case, M is equal to 3. And N is equal to 1. And then if I form A trans, so now I have two options. I can form A transpose A first, which is equal to 1, 2, 3 times 1, 2, 3. Or I can form A, A transpose, which is equal to 1, 2, 3 times 1, 2, 3. And then compute its eigenvalues. Now, which ones do you guys think it's easier? The first one, right? Because the first one, when you multiply, when I multiply this, it's going to give me a 3 by 3 matrix. And then I'm going to have to compute the eigenvalues of a 3 by 3 matrix. And that's going to take a long time. <laughs> okay? If, on the other hand, and this is like the happy guy here, because this guy is just going to be equal to 14. Now, 14 is a matrix. It's a matrix with one element. It's a one by one matrix. So I can write 14 in particular as 1 times square root of 14 squared times 1. OK? Now, from the previous page, I know that AA transpose, um, did I get this right? Yes. I know that A transpose A is equal to V sigma square V transpose. Okay, so this should be V sigma squared V transpose. Okay, because we actually proved that A transpose A is equal to V sigma squared V transpose. Therefore, sigma is just equal to the matrix that has square root of 14. And V is just equal to 1, which is a beautiful orthogonal matrix because 1 times 1 is 1. It's, sigma squared is non unique in that first instance. Like it doesn't have to be, um, or, or is it, does it have to be unique? <coughs> like it 
V has to be one. V has to be one. It's orthogonal. Therefore, oh, it's therefore, right. sigma is unique. Okay. But now comes the question: How do we get? We also know. Okay. We also know that A A transpose is equal to U sigma squared U transpose. Okay. We derived that before. It was this guy. All right. So this means that in order to get U we might have to solve the eigenvalues of a 3 by 3 matrix and compute its eigenvectors. So that doesn't sound good. Is there another way to do it? We already know sigma. Mm -hmm. And if we just square then it's just a number. And we have the other representation? And then we just have u, u transpose. Which is the other one? You're along the right direction. And it helps that we already know V and sigma. Well, we also know that UU transpose is the identity matrix. Uh, is it UU transpose or UU transpose U? <coughs> yes. So A is equal to U, sigma V, and we know A, what is, we know sigma Ha, v. you got it. We also know that A, by definition, is just U sigma V transpose. Yes. Yes. Okay. So what do we do? I'm going to do a few steps here. The first step, and this is now I'm going to go slowly because this is how we solve for matrices. The first step, I multiply A times V and use sigma times V and then V transpose V is just the identity, so I have that AV is equal to U sigma. Next, I multiply V times sigma minus 1, and I get U, which, if I put everything together, is just 1 over square root 14 times the matrix A, which is 1, 2, 3, and we're done. Okay, so I'll take your thing in office hours. So I'm not sure why did we write V as the I mean, how do we know in the first step 14 equal to that decomposition? <laughs> how is that unique? V has, so we, we did a decomposition of three matrices. V, we know that this is equal to an expression of this form. Yeah. And the norm of V has to be 1. And V has to be squared. So it, it, it can, the norm of V, sorry, V is an orthogonal matrix, so V transpose V has to be the identity. And V has to be squared. And V transpose V times sigma has to be 14. Therefore, the only possible V I could have is V equal to 1. Um, I'm going to finish this lecture on Monday, but let me just give you a taste of what's to come. Um, when I take a matrix A, which is an image, um, and this is now giving you the rest of that story, um, I can, I've plotted there the components. But then I'm also plotting an image now that's 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4. That's the sum of the first components. Okay. So this is just basically this one plus this one plus this one plus this one. The implication of this is that if I have a matrix, an image, I can rewrite that matrix in terms of just a few of the terms in the expansion. And that still gives me an image that sort of looks like this image. <coughs> the advantage, though, will be that over here, I have n by n pixels, you know, like a 1,000 by a 1,000. Whereas here, I only have one, two, because this is the same transpose. So here I have 2 times 1,000. 
numbers. Okay? And so that's going to be sort of the key to it. That the world is going to be huge. It's going to be n squared. But my representation is going to be order n. And with order n, I'm going to be able to describe the world. So I'm going to reduce it by a factor of um, n. Um, I will lose detail, however. There's a constant there. If my constant is 4, um, the clown sort of looks blurred. And as I increase, if I add two more sets of brush strokes, I get a clown that has more detail. And of course, if I add a 10, I would get something that almost looks like the original clown. As we will see, it's possible to come up with an image that looks almost like the original image, but with much less storage. And that's sort of the basis for image compression. And it's also important to learning because learning is about finding small representations of the world. Still on an end. As you get closer and closer, like it still continues to be. Yes. Okay. Except we're going to have to do B even. This is our first take of trying to get a sparse representation. And then we'll have to be even smarter to get an even sparser representation. Because x1, x1 transpose is a matrix. Oh, but you never store, that's a good question. You never store the matrix. You only store the vector. And when you need to see the image, you multiply the vectors and you display the image. Exactly. So that's where the gain is. All right. Have a good Friday and weekend. Oh, um, one last one announcement. If your surname and ends in A to K, that's your homework. And if it ends in 